Okay, thank you. So uh, our last event for the symposium, before we go downstairs uh, for the art exhibition, uh, is that we're going to hear from uh, students. Uh, and I'm very excited about this panel. And so these students, and um, we'll introduce them in a sec, uh, are all in different, uh, studying different things at the university. And they're going to talk about information challenges that they see, you know, right now, and perhaps what you know, how they think they will play out uh, as they move into their um, careers. And so the moderator of the panel is Professor uh, Melissa uh, Chomintra, and uh, she's going to, she'll introduce everyone, and then we'll, she'll kick us off with questions. All right. It's been a while since I've used a microphone, so this always feels so awkward to me. But um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our student panel. The title of the panel is Boilermakers Discuss Information Challenges in Their Future Professional Lives. So as students, you face a plethora of information challenges on a daily basis, right? So from sorting through the sheer volume of information available to you to determining the reliability and credibility of sources, Doing so requires you to navigate a complex web of information to successfully complete your coursework and projects. As you prepare to enter the workforce, these challenges may become more complex and nuanced. The rapid pace of technology advancements, the growing volume of data, and the emergence of new sources of information are just some of the factors that contribute to the complexity of the information landscape. So today, as um, Clarence pointed out, we have gathered a group of students from diverse academic backgrounds to share their experiences and insights on the information challenges they have faced during their studies and the ones they anticipate in their future careers. So our student panelists are Maeve Kampanik. Did I say that correctly? Kampanik. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for correcting me. Um, from pharmacy. Good, okay, good with our mics, all right. Um, Katie Goldner from Technology, and if I did not say that right, correct me. Uh, Katrina Payne um, from Professional Writing, and Emily Prim from Journalism. So we hope that this discussion will shed light on the various strategies and tools that can be leveraged to effectively navigate the information challenges that lie ahead for y'all. So I'm gonna start the discussion with our first question. Um, what do you see as the most significant information challenge in your chosen field, and how have you seen that play out in your studies? So anyone who wants to start, go for it. Pass the mic along as you go. Here, I'll start us off. All right. So in pharmacy and in healthcare in general, we're seeing an increase in accessibility of healthcare information to patients. And I think that's a great barrier that came down. But in the meantime, there's a new barrier, which is that you, most people don't have very good health literacy. And they're struggling to tell the difference between high quality health information and misinformation. And even when they do find high quality information, they don't really have the skills necessary to interpret it. So I think that's an issue that's on the rise that we'll need to address soon. It's not an issue that I've dealt directly with as a student yet, but as I get more and more experience with patients, I will. Um, I am also in a similar boat. So I work with one of our um, librarians here named um, Andrea, and I've helped her this semester do uh, research for her research um, project about uh, African-American women with um, endometriosis and health um, literacy. And we've just noticed a really drastic thing between um, like the African-American community and health literacy in general. And um, a lot of people, women especially, just don't understand that you don't exactly have to do the very specific thing that the doctor suggests and you do have options. And I think just being able to spread health um, literacy and just get people to understand that they don't always just have to do what they're told and they can speak up when they don't believe that things are right with their health um, is a really big deal. Um, is this, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think speaking, um, at least from my exponent perspective, access to information is often our biggest barrier. 
um, turning to either the university or local police department, um, there is often some hesitancy and delay towards um, providing information. Um, and even once we get it, there's no guarantee that all the information will be there. Um, I meant to bring a sheet of paper today that we got back recently from the university, um, but it'll be easy to picture. Um, it was a big black square um, of, in of information we'd requested, and what we got back was a big black redacted square. Um, so access is generally our issue. Um, so I'm kind of in the social media tech sphere um, as a mass and media communication student. Um, and in my research for my honor scholarly project, um, I was looking at kind of the ethics um, in social media and looking at uh, filters and how that kind of changes people's perspective and then filters, for lack of a better word, um, some of the information that gets relayed, um, especially like in ads and things like that. And I think the barrier is the trustworthiness of sources and finding out what what sources can you trust? What ads can you trust? Um, especially with the up and coming technologies with AI and everything like that, it's becoming increasingly hard to know what sources you can trust um, and knowing what's real and what's fake. I think y'all all sort of speak to this um, idea and need for advocacy um, for um, information, obviously, right, and correct. Um, authoritative information, especially in things like health, right, where there are um, real effects to um, bad information, whether it's mis and disinformation, um, and some of the true fallout that can happen with that, right? Um, and it kind of leads into our next question about information literacy. Um, which I think was also a thread in some of y'all's answers to the first question, and the fact that it can mean many different things in different fields um, and contexts. So how has your experience as a Purdue student changed the way that you interact with information, either personally or academically, right? Because you're, all, you're not just um, moving through this world now as a student, right? You are like young adults in the world um, making your own choices. Um, so you bring in your own lived experience as well as like what you're um, engaging with on um, campus. So if you can speak to that. Um, so in research, I think it's shown as a student that there's a lot of information out there and that we need to do our research. Um, I think I've learned that you can't just take things at surface value um, and what they're presented as. Um, I think like taking, for example, my filters research, um, you can't just take them like, oh yeah, they're beauty filters, they make you look cool on social media. Um, but looking below that and kind of like, okay, what are the racial biases that are in those and what is the history behind that? Um, and also like, how is this changing like social beliefs of how we should be looking or what are what are the new trends and things like that and I think I've carried that on to, into a lot of different studies um, here at Purdue and I think it's going to be a really helpful tool into my career to not just take information that people get me as is um, but to make sure I do my research and look into kind of the history and any biases things that go into uh, the information that they're presenting to me. Um, one thing that I've learned is um, to kind of have to be creative sometimes where we, where we get the information that we're looking for. Um, because like I said, with the even if we do end up getting the information from the university, it can take months. Um, we just got back something that we put in a request for in October of 2021. Um, so it, it, having to be creative and um, I, actually, over the summer, I plan on going to law school and becoming a lawyer. Over the summer, I worked with um, a couple of lawyers, and I was shocked and amazed to find that they can just, they can subpoena information. They can make you give them the information, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, <laughs> it, it, so, um, you know, if um, having trouble getting something from the university, are there any professors that have something they could say or any students that can talk about, talk about their experiences and um, just finding workarounds. Um, so as an English and history student, I've definitely had to do my fair share of uh, reading and research. So I've had to look through a lot of research um, articles those can be pretty dense and long, so I've definitely learned how to just uh, go through those to look 
more for the um, answers and information I need rather than like reading the whole thing word for word. Um, and then also just uh, working in the um, libraries and the archives, I've also just gotten to work with a lot of like primary materials and things like that that a lot of people don't get to, which has been really unique. And then also a thing is just being like a college student here. There's a lot of people that I can ask when I'm like struggling to find an answer for something, which is really nice. And a lot of people in like the public sphere don't really have like reliable access to information or people that they can ask for these things. So as a uh, student, I've just had a lot of like information that I've been able to like um, work with and gain that I wouldn't have if I'd just not been here. Yeah, and for me, um, a big part of pharmacy practice is being able to keep on top of all the new literature coming out of, and studies. And so I've had some very direct uh, experiences through my doctor of pharmacy program teaching me how to interact with information and evaluate it. So I've really developed some concrete like technical skills when it comes to approaching academic literature. Um, like for example, before uh, my program, I think I had a really simplistic view of what it meant for a study to be biased. You know, on TV shows and in the news, it's if the person who paid for it is going to tip the results in their favor. But now, as a pharmacist, if I throw out every study that was funded by the manufacturer, I'm left with nothing. So I have to take a more nuanced view to it and really look at things closely at the little details to determine if it's biased or not. And it's not as simple as some people would make you think it is. Sir, again, very great answers. And, um, you know, it speaks to your wide sort of the, the breadth of your experience up here as you all come from dis different disciplines um, and sort of speaking um, to that role of the, the power that is sort of systemic in information, right? When you talked about the um, ability for information to like change like social constructs of even body image or the idea of power to subpoena information and sort of that like, that ability for information to um, be extremely nuanced and complicated, right? So um, with those things being said, um, Currently, as a student, how do you feel empowered, or not empowered, <laughs> um, to address the information challenges that you see in your field? Um, and if you've had any opportunities at Purdue as a student to explore or address these challenges, you could also touch on that. Um, so, as a student journalist, as part of the exponent, we are uniquely empowered in ways other journalists are not, in that we're not taken seriously all the time. Um, and so that, it, that can be helpful in that um, people may, sometimes it, sometimes it hurts, but sometimes it helps in that people um, may be willing to give an interview that they wouldn't to somebody who's got, I don't know, like a Washington Post, New York Times badge. Um, I don't know if they have, maybe a name tag, I don't know if they have badges. Um, <laughs> I, so as a st and being able to work freely um, and not under you know we don't really have anybody telling us what we have to publish what we need to publish what information we should be seeking what information we shouldn't be she seeking um, we're really given a lot of freedom um, and that's that's really helpful we can we can um, trying to think of some examples here um, and none are coming to mind, but um, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of freedom. Um, I've felt really empowered through a lot of the like faculty and staff. Um, I'll shout out Dr. Weinberg, my scholarly project advisor, um, and she's been really great in sharing like resources with me that I didn't even know were out there. Um, and I think just part of that is knowing like the knowledge of knowing things are out there. <laughs> like I had no idea like things to search for, topics to search for, and there's just a plethora of information out there. And it's just getting to know those like keywords that you need to search for or topics that you didn't know hadn't really been explored yet um, and I really found that with like the biases behind um, 
social media filters. Um, and I have really loved getting to explore that and really diving deep and going into the history of like what were the racial biases from like the 1800s that then came up through like the I believe it's like the 60s and 70s with Kodak Shirley um, and then now into social media filters that this is not a new thing that filters um, really favor the the white face and the perfect uh, skin and everything like that um, and yeah, it's been really great to be able to talk to different professors as resources um, that you might not be able to find that information online. That's really unique, I think, about Purdue is the professors are really willing to talk with you and share the information that they know about certain topics, which has been awesome. Yeah, and for me, I feel like I'm empowered and not empowered in different ways to address like different information literacy issues in my practice. I feel like healthcare professionals do a really good job of educating ourselves on how to uh, analyze and evaluate literature, but we don't focus enough on how we're going to communicate that complicated high-level information to our patients. I feel like my program could improve itself if it focused more on patient communication from time to time. We do little activities here and there, but I feel like we could really go into depth in that and we don't. And it's really easy to lose perspective of what is and isn't common knowledge after four years in a high level program. And I feel like that's something that deserves more attention. Yeah, I mean, here at um, Purdue, there's a lot of different research opportunities for students. It's just sometimes hard to seek them out, but I feel like for the most part, most of the professors here are willing to take on students and help them to learn because like students, they are also just continuously learning, which is really interesting. And I think that's really cool. And that's how um, I got to do my research with Andrea because she does um, research in um, women's health. And I said, hey, I'm also really interested in that. Do you want a research assistant? And she said, sure. And so we just, um, been just uh, able to do our research. And then she asked me if I was like interested in anything particular. And most of the time I'm used to like helping other people with their research. So it was really like a unique opportunity to have her ask me that. And then me say my idea and then she's like, okay, well then we can do that. And I'm like, okay. Um, and my um, idea was how a uh, female body image is impacted by playing like video games and seeing how women's bodies are represented in that. And in my head, I'm like, that sounds kind of silly. But she was like, no, that's a great idea. And then she gave me some names of people who can like also give me some more um, information on that, just some good resources on where to find more information on that. And it's like helping me with the research process because it can be kind of annoying because you can do a lot of reading and spend a lot of time and not have a lot to show for it, even though you are doing a lot. Um, so that's been a really unique um, opportunity. So now I feel more just like able to speak my mind and like say what like um, issues I think are pretty prominent because even if it sounds silly to you, it is an issue and some other people might think it's really interesting too. Absolutely. It sounds like you all have had um, some good experiences um, on both sides, whether feeling empowered or, or um, to the alternative, not um, empowered um, in terms of your building your journey with your relationship um, to information. Um, it seems like it's kind of um, a wide span, right, with you and your experience with the exponent and having this sort of like unfettered um, ability to um, sort of tackle the stories that you feel like are important, right, which is a really cool um, and powerful experience, I think, to sort of have no um, barriers or restrictions, right? Um, so I think that those are all very interesting, and I, I like to hear about y'all's experience with and your relationships with faculty who have empowered you. Um, I think that's really, um, really great to hear. Um, and also for faculty in the audience to think about the ways that they can continue to empower students around these ideas of information. So I think that adds a lot to the conversation. 
Um, so with that said, our last question is what experiences, knowledge, or resources have been or will be most helpful in preparing you to combat the information challenges you may encounter in your future career? And what um, would you need looking forward to your job, like if there's like a gap? I would say mine, um, I mean, I want to be a um, librarian eventually. So I think just having the um, experience of being able to like work in the libraries here and with the librarians and then also in the um, archives has just been like a really unique opportunity to just get some like actual work experience rather than just doing classes, which are also helpful, but it's nice to like implement what you learn in these classes into like the real world and probably um one of my most helpful experiences here has been last summer when i was actually here working in the um, archives to put together the um, exhibit we had last fall for the 50th anniversary of the apollo 17 moon landing um because up to that point i had never really been in the archives i visited our archives once on a tour for a class. Um, but it was really unique to get to see all these different like primary source materials because information isn't just like words on a page. A lot of it is, but there is also um, cool things, just like artifacts of like um, clothing, there can be pins, badges, things like that. And I think it's really unique because archives don't just have boxes of papers we have like actual things in there too so it was a really unique experience to just kind of like look at all these things and um be able to like research them and then eventually put them together into like a cohesive story um so it was a really great experience to learn about that and then also solidified that i do really like libraries and archives and that's what i want to do um so yeah that experience was great and was just a really nice thing to do over my summer rather than just take more like classes or something because those are one thing but it's also just nice to have some also like experience too yeah so um i said earlier there were some activities that my program had put in place that that addressed uh, patient literacy, health literacy. And while I don't think there are enough, there were a few that were particularly impactful that I think are going to help me in my future. Um, each semester, the College of Pharmacy helps organize interprofessional experiences, which are events where uh, different healthcare students, nursing students, uh, pre-med students, and dietary science students usually come together and act as an interdisciplinary team and sort of simulate that environment. And one semester, the patient case we were working on was a patient who specifically came in with a lot of misconceptions about COVID-19 treatments. And he had done his own research, but a lot of the research was from not very reputable, reputable sources. And we had to come together and figure out how we were going to approach a patient like this who was excited to participate in his own health care, but needed guidance. And I think activities like that were really, are really valuable for my learning and are going to help me better address uh, patient health literacy in my future career. Um, I think... I think I'm taking in that I can, I am empowered to educate others as well. Um, I think being able to learn these research skills here and learn that there are resources out there that I can look through and sift through and be able to take that information and share it with others. Um, I have found that particularly empowering in creating the website for my project and just wanting to share it with people um, because it's a topic that's not often explored these days. Um, and so I kind of want to take that into my career in wanting to go into social media and content creation um, and just wanting to be transparent with others about the issues that are out there in the field um, and wanting to kind of synthesize everything that I've been researching and sharing it with others and then wanting to kind of reciprocate that and learn from others and what they're researching and learning in our field as well, um, just to continue that education process and knowing, especially in the tech field, that it's never going to stop. Like we're always going to be learning more and needing to kind of uncover what's happening under all these uh, technologies and any biases that are occurring and stuff like that. What I'll be able to take um, 
from my time at Purdue into, my, into the future is being able to weave a story. Um, constantly searching for information. Um, we, we love the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, where we <laughs> get our, and I'll continue with that, but I'll, they'll be le legally obligated to give to me in the future, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> And, but constantly searching for that information, uncommon places I might be able to find it, and then with all of that information, telling a story um, as an attorney. Um, it, as an attorney, I'll be able to throw my own opinion in there more often, which <laughs> I'll be, appreciate. Um, but yeah, I mean, my classes are great. Purdue has fan, some fantastic programs, but I know that what I'm going to, when I look back in 30 years, it'll be my time in the newsroom, it'll be my time in the field, um, in my interaction with information there that will um, have formed me into a better attorney. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's all very insightful. Um, and you each speak to sort of this idea of what you have been able to sort of learn in the classroom and then cultivate and grow in some very like practical, hands-on, real world um, experiences, right, which we all know employers love, a well-rounded person. They don't just want you in the classroom. So the way that you've been able to translate some of your like information literacy skills like to both the um, in the classroom and outside, I think is really great and speaks to some of the experiences that you have been able to um, take advantage of um, at Purdue. So that's really great. Um, do we have time for questions? Okay, cool. I didn't want to like open it up if. <laughs> okay, yes, we do. So cool. if right. you uh, or if people have questions, uh, either online and Rachel can read them out, but we need to use the mic so that people online can hear yes. us. So I'll run around with the mic and. Cool. So do folks have questions? Yes. Yeah. Erla. So it's kind of a big question, and that is, you know, in libraries, we have some very unique things that we offer, right? We have information literacy courses that we teach. Um, people often think is Google is the only place, or you just you know search online. But there's a lot more depth to what we offer in libraries. So I wonder, um, how do you think we can attract students to take some of those classes and understand the value of those classes? Um, you know, we're we, we're teaching classes in libraries as well, and and students don't always are not always attracted to the classes necessarily. So I wonder from your perspective and what you've learned, what's the messaging that would appeal to students or help have them understand that they might just have the tip of the iceberg if they just go on to Google and do some kind of a little search, that there's so much more. Um, okay, this might be a bit of a plain answer, but um, I would say, and I don't know how um, you go about doing this, but adding some of these like library classes um, to count for like requirements that students need for their degrees. Like I know a lot of people have a lot of options for like general requirements. I know it sounds like a really simple answer, but honestly, I would love to take some of these classes, but it's just hard because I can't fit them in my schedule because they would just be classes that I would be taking as like an elective. And I would love to take them, but it's just like I have to fit in the other ones that I have to do for that degree. So I feel like looking into that um, could be really helpful because it could attract a lot more students, especially ones that like um, want to take them like me, but just don't really have room in their schedule because then it's like, oh, I want to take this and it'll count towards this. So of course I'll take it. Um, so yeah, that was that would be what I would do, but I don't know how you go about doing that. Um, I think also like trying to integrate some of those classes or maybe like tastes of those classes into existing classes as well. Um, I'm taking an honors course about electric vehicles in the media um, and I've been exposed to a lot of resources through that because it's basically just a whole course on doing a research paper on like topics around EVs in the media. 
Um, and so I've learned how to use like ProQuest and more things in the library resources. And so I think it would be helpful even just integrating little parts of those and being like, hey, there's more resources out there besides what we're doing in class or what you could be introduced to in these classes. Um, and kind of even just letting people know that they exist because I don't think I knew that there were <laughs> classes out there for that as well. And I, it would have been helpful to have take, taken those during my time at Purdue. Yeah, and personally for me, whenever I go out of my way to do a university-related activity or uh, an extra, not extracurricular, um, I always, elective, I always get that mixed up, uh, <laughs> course, I'm always chasing the newest line on my CV or resume. So if the elective was the sort of class that I would have some sort of new certification or certificate or something or a new professional project finished by the end of the class, that would be a class I'm more interested in. That is some very good insight. <laughs> I think those are some things we have considered and others we haven't. So the student perspective is very valuable. <laughs> are there any other questions? Other questions for our panelists? Or are there any online questions, Rachel? No, not yet. Okay. Okay. Well, we can go ahead and close out. So um, thank you all so much. Thank you.